Hey there, and welcome back to the Hub of Junior Golf Podcast. I'm Ryan Burr, joined as always by the founder of the Junior Golf Hub, Roger Nick. And Roger, uh, really fun week, obviously, as we've got Corn Ferry Q School going on. You know, this is the time of year, I always say this, you know, we always talk about pressure, and certainly you saw it with Rory at the U.S. Open. I mean, a pressure to win a major is real, but real pressure is when you're playing to be a professional and you either have a job or you don't. Uh, certainly, we are seeing some real pressure playing out on both the PGA Tour, the Corn Ferry Tour. I mean, guys that are absolutely playing to, to see if they're going to make any money next year. I, I, th- I think it's enjoyable golf. It, it is enjoyable golf for us to watch. <laughs> I don't know about us to go out and play in, but I think it's enjoyable for us to watch. And you never know who's going to show up, right? I mean, uh, I think that is the fun of this time of year where you got guys who get on a hot streak and uh, like like a Matt McCarty, right? I mean, the guy, un- unbelievable hot streak this guy was on. Uh, but the unknowns, the, you know, the ones who come from nowhere and end up, you know, getting their uh, tour cards and then going out and actually having a, a great career. Uh, so it's always fun to see what might happen. Um, I, I will say, I don't know if you were watching the St. Andrews the Collegiate event recently um, and just watching uh, the, the talent that's there as well. It's, it's so much fun to see. Right. And, and certainly we saw that on display last week at the NB3 match play where you think about it, you have Stanford, Texas, University of New Mexico and New Mexico State, according to the rankings, and we all know how how you and I are on rankings, New Mexico State was the fourth ranked team, and obviously they went on to win. And with that, we welcome in our guest here on the Hubba Junior Golf Podcast, T.K. Chantana Newitt, the freshman at Stanford, number one freshman. He's got his uh, got the hair going, the jacket on. It's early in the morning in in uh, California, so T.K. Thanks so much for joining us. We know you're on your way to class, which is a, a big, big deal at Stanford, and you guys are are playing your, your next event. Let's just start with this. You're a freshman at Stanford. You obviously grew up in Thailand. Uh, what's the biggest adjustment to Stanford college life and, and the United States, for that matter? Yeah, first of all, um, thank you guys for having me. And, well, I mean, I don't feel any big adjustments in terms of moving to the U.S. coming from Thailand because I've I spent a lot of time here in the past playing junior events. But college life in general, not just at Stanford, is a huge adjustment. Like I've spent pretty much my whole life with my parents. I'm really close to my parents. So not having them here with me, that's that's a big change. And they've actually been here with me since June because I did summer quarter, but they're leaving and I think just after I come back from my tournament, so that's that's huge. Yeah. Well, well, TK. One of the things we like to try to understand here on the show and give our audience some some feedback on is, uh, here you are, a young man who had tremendous success young. How did you do it? What was the secret to your success young and where you are now? And you're still young. Um, and uh, to be on the farm now at Stanford is is pretty impressive at, at your age. So. Tell us a little bit. What was your secrets? Um, there is no secret. I think all the greats have said this in the past. Not that I'm one of them, but it's just hard work. I think I'm just a just a huge believer in working hard, whether it's school or golf or anything in life in general. Yeah. So, so what did you work on the most? Uh, golf skills. Uh, obviously, you worked on everything, right? I mean, we know that. Uh, you have to have that. But you know, did you say that my golf skills from putting to driving the golf ball? What was more important? Uh, was it your physical side of it? Did you go to the gym every day? What what made it so so that you were so successful so early? Um, I would say short game and just accuracy, just purely because I grew up always playing with older guys. So I was never, ever the longest or even close to being the longest. So I just had to learn how to keep it in the fairway and make birdie like whenever I can. That's a good plan. Yeah. yeah. So now, I do hit the gym and I am trying to improve in, in that area, but obviously that, that's going to take time. I'm still not the biggest guy as well. So it's let's, take a lot uh, of let's kind of go through the process as you know, your claim to fame, obviously the, you're the youngest player ever to win a professional event. You won the trust golf uh, mixed Asian championship. So at 15, uh, was the plan then to be professional? I know you played a couple of live events. 
Uh, and then now you're at Stanford. Just kind of walk me through from winning that event at 15. Did you consider going straight professional or was college always the goal? I feel like college like was always the goal. My education has been really important. I started golf, playing golf when I was three and a half years old. But um, at the same time, I also went to one of the like most like it's just a, it's just a really big academic school in Bangkok, so that was always a huge part of my life. So we always um, valued academics. But then when I won, and then I was guaranteed obviously like an Asian tour card, the potential to play on live, DP DP World invites, like turning pro was was a really really like compelling offer at that time. But, and we were close, we were close. Um, when I played my first Liv event, I was doing pretty well through um, two rounds. And Liv has this option where an amateur can declare to turn pro 54 minutes after he, they send in the scorecard. Yeah, yeah, wow. it's, it's, it's cool. So <laughs> I, I, I don't know if that's still the case, but when I played, that was the case. So then, like I still remember that week in London, me and my like, that was the only thing on our minds. We were not stressed, but we were like, it was it was a huge decision. And then I talked to my team captain for that event, Phil Mickelson, and he told me that if you turn pro early, it's gonna be a few years early, and you would be doing it for the money. And he said, don't do it because. I'm going to have a career, hopefully, of multiple decades, and I'm going to make so much money in that period of time where if I turn pro maybe two, three years like early, the money I make in those two, three years is going to be irrelevant by the end of my career. So it just wouldn't be worth it. I'm like, damn, that's that's a great point. <laughs> and that, that's also that's also like part of why I came to Stanford as well. I wanted to make my time here worth it. It not that interesting. I mean, Phil Mickelson giving you that advice. I mean, he's someone yeah, exactly. who obviously had success and won as an amateur um, and very early as well. So what what great advice, uh, that kind of big brother advice there, not just business advice. Yeah, so I got insane, insanely lucky with meaning Phil. He's, he's a great guy. Yeah, because I think a, a few other players may have said the other way, right? Hey, oh, yeah, take the sure. money and run. I mean, set yourself up for life. You can go back to school anytime. But, uh, you know, being, get, being able to get that advice now and take advantage of that and go to a, a, go to the farm at Stanford, right? Be on the farm there, develop your skills even more, get your, get your net worth up even more from that, from that standpoint, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the topics that we have a lot on the, on the, on the channel here, the um, podcast, is NIL stuff, right? I'm not asking you to talk about it, but is that something that does enter your mind as a player uh, like you who had success? Is NIL money something that is of interest to you? Do you have an NIL contract or agreement? Um, to put it plainly, I did have NILs for 22 and 23. And if anything, because of those NILs, I was able to come to college in the first place. Like, like I probably would have came anyways, but with those NILs, it made – it basically lowered the opportunity costs is what I'm trying to say. Like mm -hmm. it wasn't like turn pro and get a ton of money or nothing at all. It was like a bit of an IL that would have like blasted me through college anyways, or extra money. So that, that, that definitely changed. That was a huge, huge factor in my decision to come to college. You were top 10 in the uh, world amateur golf rankings. You'd won a professional event at 15. I think our audience probably assumes that you were recruited by every school in the country, but it sounds like this wasn't even a big recruiting process. You kind of went to Stanford academically before golf even came up. Is that accurate? Um, I, to, to be completely honest, I would that was that's a little stretch. Like I, I don't know if I'm going to get in <laughs> if I would have gotten into Stanford without sports at all, but. I definitely valued academics, so Stanford was kind of my number one. And I also um probably worth mentioning that I reclassed unofficially. I look, I'm an international student. I I was really wasn't familiar with the admissions process, especially as, like as an international student athlete. But basically, what happened was I went to a British international school. I um I was supposed to graduate in 2025, but because long story short the british system if you graduate a british high school you go to the british university 
you can graduate in three years instead of four. I basically asked all the universities, hey, can I skip that and just start a year early because I'm going to do four years anyways to graduate. Wow. wow so that's I, I reclass as well. And m- most, most schools didn't know that. And ironically, <laughs> Stanford, to be fair, like full credit to Coach Ray and the admissions committee, they – Stanford was one of the most – like clear schools about what I needed to do to get in like some of the other schools of like 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 really good schools too but they're not Stanford like the ones I talked to some other schools they were they were not nearly as clear as Stanford to me for in terms of what I had to do to get in yeah and that's a big question for us here right I mean a lot of our audience is international we have international players and parents always asking Mm -hmm. it is much tougher for that for the international student to come to America it seems because understanding all the nuances it takes from a recruiting standpoint um can you obviously you're learning and you learned a little bit um is there some things that we want to tell the audience about that process uh you know, wh- why it might be the best choice for an international student to come to the U.S. or somewhere else to play. Um, do you have some insights on that? Right. Um, well, why would it be wise to come to the U.S.? Well, for me, it was a good decision because I wanted to play golf in the U.S., whether it's live or PJ Tour or majors, everything's in the U.S., right? It doesn't matter. You you want to come here anyways. The way I see it, it's like an internship. You get to play on that soil. You learn all the things about the U.S., and in terms of the admissions process, I would say just kind of like the way good golf solves everything, good grades solve everything. If if they like you, they're going to help you. Yeah. Yeah, we always tell our students at the, Academy, the Golf Performance Academy, get good grades and work on getting better at golf, right? I mean, good grades are going to get you into more schools than golf is yeah. uh, just because there's so few spots. So that, that that's 100%. great advice. TK. Again, now you're in college, and I think that is, you know, that's probably the biggest change that is happening quickly in the U.S., which is with PGA Tour U, with where college golf is on television weekly now, it we're seeing, you know, Nick Dunlap wins as an amateur, wins twice in the PGA Tour. Luke Clanton at Florida State is top 10 in just about every week on a sponsor's exemption, but he's still at Florida State. Tell our viewers, so you've played professional events. You played on Live, on Phil Mickelson's team. Now you've seen college golf up close. How good is the talent around the country playing college golf? Yeah, I mean, like, it's college golf is literally the PGA Tour, but four years before it. Basically, like, I mean, you look at these guys, Luke, all the, like, guys that have – all the top college players are going to be top PJ Tour players. So, like the talent at the top, it's definitely there. You yeah, know, I that's, loved, that's why I, I'm here. Yeah, I, I loved your your sentiment that this is an apprenticeship, right? I mean, you're looking yeah, at this absolutely. as an apprenticeship, and I really think that is something that uh, parents and players, young, young juniors, need to understand: is that this is a great opportunity uh, for to come and develop your game and and work on other things in your life, kind of with some um, safety net, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you have a safety net at, at school and uh, and it's being paid for, those kind of things. So I think it's really interesting uh, that you've taken this route uh, at a talent level that you are, you've taken this route to say, I can be better. You personally want to be better, not only from a golf perspective, but also academically, you want to be better. And I think that's really a, a great message for a lot of the young players out there to hear. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, well, I believe college is going to help me get better, especially at Stanford. The facilities are amazing. Like, I have full access to them. It's pretty much been my dream. And also, like, when you, when you, like, when you're a university graduate, you, you always have an option, whether if golf doesn't work out, you know, that's not the end of your life. And ironically, um, the first time, for the first time ever in my life, I felt like I would be fine without golf. Coming here, starting school for the first time in my life, I felt, damn, let's say I break a leg tomorrow, I might actually not be homeless or, or unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> worst, like, all I, like, worst case, I only have a Stanford degree to rely on. 
assuming I graduate, of course. But yes. hopefully it doesn't come to that. But yeah, like um, it's it's weird because it puts a little more pressure at the same time, but at the same time it also relieves pressure. Yeah. What's it? What are you studying? STS probably. I'm oh I'm I'm in so many random classes. I have probably the easiest freshman fall of all time. <laughs> I'm in communications, um, psych one. That's intro to psychology. Yeah. A uh, few random classes, and I'm gonna make up for it by doing intro to quantum physics next next quarter. There you go. That so- sounds like that's a make up. Uh, so so that's important, right? I mean, one of the things I know a lot of mm-hmm. our young players will talk about would be, what do I do when I get into my freshman year? How's that transition gonna look like? It sounds like you set yourself up for a really good opportunity, not to overload yourself in the classroom and really give a, your your attention to your golf, but not let class slide. So. What would be some good advice there? Um, just time management. It's like high school, slightly scaled up with, I would say, it's not, you, you don't necessarily get less help, but you definitely do have to plan, like you're planning things by yourself all the time. Like the first thing you're going to lose is your parents, that's for sure. And the teachers, they don't chase you down. Like they, they don't remind you, hey, you you got a deadline tomorrow morning. You like, you just have to do all that yourself. So it's just just staying on just discipline. I know that you guys like that's what everyone says, but that's that's really how it is. TK, uh, watching you uh, broadcast in your event, the NB3 match play this past week in New Mexico, uh, you play with just a ton of swag. Uh, Noda and I discussing on the air. I mean, you pretty much do a club twirl on every shot. <laughs> uh Obviously, Tiger uh, has Thai in him. We know how popular he is in your your homeland of Thailand. Uh, what influence is just the the myth of Tiger Woods going to Stanford? Some of that swag. Uh, how much has that influenced your game? Um, well, so I, if anything, it influenced my dad, who then influenced me. Because to, to specifically about the club tour, I remember when I was four years old, just learning how to swing the club. There's this one day, he um. We went, we, we were at the range and he taught, like, legit, just straight up taught me the club troll. And it's kind of been a part of my swing. So. But yeah, t- t- Tiger, Tiger's obviously huge in Thailand. And my, da- my dad's, like, a really, really, really into golf. So Tiger was obviously his. <laughs> That's a great story. His, yeah. That story you just told is going to be shown on NBC and ESPN <laughs> and CBS when you're winning your first major. Trust me on that. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. And also, also with Tiger, the, I still remember I found out of Stanford um, when I was probably 11 years old. I, I, I knew I wanted to go to a good university. I've known of four good universities, Stanford, Oxford, Cambridge, and Harvard. I did a quick search on the internet. Where did Tiger Woods go to school? Stanford University, and I was sold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good school. Yeah. Tiger went there. Can't really ask for more. That, that's right. And here you are, following his footsteps. Uh, congratulations on all your success. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. w- Want to hit you one more thing? Since you've yeah. left, obviously this year, uh, the Junior Golf Hub NB3 Junior Tour in Thailand is underway with the help of Dr. Prin. Mm-hmm. I believe there are six NB3 Junior Hub golf events in Thailand, ranging from September all the way to April. And then mm-hmm. players will come over and play in the NB3 World Championship, which will be on Golf Channel. Uh, what do you think of the impact that that will have in your home country, just uh, that ability for players to come directly from Thailand and play junior golf on Golf Channel in the U.S.? Absolutely huge. Like, actually, first of all, Noda. Um, thank you so much. I'd like absolute legend for what he's done, not just as a player, but what he's doing now, providing opportunities for kids, especially for like growing up in Asia. I know opportunity is pretty scarce. Um, it's like I said, it's worth coming to the U S to play if you want to play here, but it's definitely hard to do. There's just not that many ways where you can come here and play like an actually event, like an actually good event that's worth your time and money. So I think that's going to be a huge impact that's going to expose a lot of kids in Thailand and hopefully in neighboring countries in Southeast Asia too to come play the ones in Thailand and then come play in the U.S. Because I, I think it's it's definitely worth doing if you want to, you know, if you're serious about your future in golf. 
Well, TK, we know you got to get to class. We don't want to. Uh, we, we don't want to. And you're obviously getting on a plane today to go to your next event. Yeah. Uh, great start to your career. Look forward to to keeping in touch and watching this all develop. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks, TK. See you guys. Well, take care. Well, boy, Roger, he doesn't have his stuff together, does he? Oh man, you know what? What is he? Seventeen, and he's just doing all of this. I mean, it's incredible. The maturity level there and what he wants and how he's articulating it pretty pretty impressive yeah that was uh that was new for our podcast usually it's college coaches but um i found that as entertaining as i mean boy he is really real i mean there's no filter yeah, uh, yeah. who knows if we had him for a couple hours the stories he would have told but uh <laughs> you know it really is we see it uh, the world sees it. Asia is certainly becoming, it's already, uh, you know, a huge impact on the LPGA Tour, seeing it much more in college golf, not really on the PGA Tour over the top, but uh, certainly in college golf and the LPGA Tour. And, um, you know, I thought he had some good advice. I thought his advice was uh, was great. Uh, I think to your point of him being real of what it takes, um, I mean, you can't under uh understate the fact that hard work it gets you somewhere right um and i think that's one of the things he didn't say this but i think he was alluding to it you know his parents are with him right now but they're leaving yeah. um i think his independence again back to that thing that we've talked about and coaches have talked about why recruiting international players is so important and so popular now is is that independence i mean here's a guy here's a kid i say kid 15, 16 years old, playing the live tour, traveling the world. Yes, his parents are with him, but he's in these situations with these grown-ups. I mean, Phil Mickelson and his team uh, at 15, 16 years old, um, that's that's priceless. I mean, that, that kind of uh, advice, that kind of experiences, and those things that he had to do to participate um, – that you can't get that anywhere. I mean, you just can't get that in the States. I mean, yeah, we got a few guys playing in PGA tour events and, you know, blades Brown and, you know, um, Miles uh, Russell. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so you've got, a, you've got a few of that, but this, this is his life. I mean, this is, it sounds like that's what he's accustomed to at this point. Yeah. And certainly um, we know Stanford uh, will be utilizing, is utilizing PDI as part of their practice routine, had a chance to talk to their head coach, Conrad Ray, uh, and PDI was at that New Mexico event. So I'll be interesting to watch TK's numbers, especially knowing that PGA Tour U, his senior year is the ultimate goal to be able to track Roger, his PDI for four years, mm -hmm. as good as he is, I'll bet his PDI massively improves year to year as he continues to work on what PDI shows to be maybe his not quite his strengths. Yeah, no, no doubt. I mean, as he even alluded to, he needs to hit the gym a little bit more, right? I mean, there are some physical things that need to take place that that's happening right now that he's now become more aware of. Um, and that's where it is. I mean, you know, we've seen the guys who've launched from Stanford in the last couple of years, uh, Carl Phillips being one of those young players who went through PDI and was like, man, this is an eye opener for me that I know what I need to continue to work on uh, because I see it, right? I'm not just taking my stats. I'm actually looking at the lead factors like the physical stuff, like the, the ball control stuff that you, you learn from on PDI. Um, these guys are actually seeing it. They're living it now. And uh, it's been a lot of fun to see. I think for somebody like TK, you know, he keeps maturing, his body matures, his mental game is going to mature already, you know, in the, in the stratosphere, you know, at his age. But at the same time, he knows he's got room to improve, which to his point, it's an apprenticeship. Right? Yeah, no doubt. Um, certainly there's PDI. We encourage uh, all the viewers, if they haven't already, take the self-assessment. If you've not logged on to check your son or daughter's rankings or if they're interested in the ranking, if they played anywhere in the U.S. and a sanctioned tournament uh jgr will have them it's the newest ranking system it will be the ranking system of record in the united states especially as it uh, continues to develop and you had mentioned the performance center uh to tk on uh, on the podcast roger uh again for families that are considering taking that next step tell us a little bit more about the performance center 
Yeah, the Golf Performance Center is, uh, we've been around 20 years now. We've developed players. We take everyone through our PDI or our proprietary system when it comes to the five elements of success. Uh, it is a full boarding school. It is an after uh, school program as well. But the boarding school program, we have kids from nine different countries, uh, from uh, Japan to Thailand coming to Czechs, uh, Czechoslovakia. I um, mean, so we've got players from all over the world who are coming in uh, and getting better from ev you know every day. Uh, we're about to expand in uh, Florida. Uh, we're going to have a new campus in Florida uh, this spring. So we're really excited about that to give more kids you know, more opportunities. The Northeast doesn't always seem or doesn't resonate with people when it comes to golf academies, but uh, we actually keep in mind that school is so important to us. Opening up in the Northeast was really important to say, hey, academics really matter. And all the other things matter to developing holistically the player, uh, meaning that we want to make sure that their mind is good and their, their, their bodies are good. And that fits into the bigger um, plan for them when it comes to their golf skills, right? The, their golf skill development. So uh, been really exciting. We're really excited about this uh, opening a new campus in Florida. Uh, so stay tuned. Yeah, that is uh, exciting for sure. Certainly uh, the junior uh, junior golf hub is all things junior golf from your scheduling uh, to your practicing to ultimately, if you want to take the next step and, and go to boarding school, go to camps, et cetera. Uh, juniorgolfhub.com is your home for that. We thank the TK for uh, uh, fitting us in this morning right before he goes to his uh, his 7.30 a.m. class out in Stanford. Uh, of course, Roger, thank our director and producer, Michael Nick. For Roger Nick, I'm Ryan Berg. We'll see you next week on the Hub of Junior Golf Podcast.